the Starting Over Stronger Show, where you'll find help and hope for your divorce survival and recovery. Divorce well, live well. Hey ladies, this is Annie. I wanted to take just a minute and talk to you about another podcast that you might want to check out. It's called Altered Stories and it is a favorite of mine. I actually was a guest on it at one point last year to tell the story of my divorce and recovery. And the whole ministry of Altered Stories is about allowing changed women to help change other women's lives just simply by sharing their story. So I've heard stories about all kinds of topics that women have struggled through and overcome. And you actually could become a guest on this show as well if you'd be interested in sharing your story, whatever that is. So you might want to go check them out at alteredstories.org to learn more about the ministry. And then if you want to just tune in and listen to it, you'll find it on any podcast channel. You'll also find them on Eternity Ready Radio on Tuesdays from 7 to 8 p.m. Central. If you love the Starting Over Stronger show, I know you're going to love Altered Stories. It's just a wide variety of women opening their heart to tell you about real struggles they've been through and how they've overcome. I encourage you to go tune in and look for my story. I believe it's number eight. It just says Annie's story. And I'd love for you to hear my story of divorce and recovery. And while you're there, you'll be able to tune in to all the other great stories. Thanks so much, guys. And welcome to the Starting Over Stronger podcast. We're here to talk about your divorce survival and recovery. And today we're going to be revisiting a subject we've talked a little bit about before, but we're going to really dig in a little bit deeper today. And that is divorce and your mortgage and or your housing situation in general and what you can do about that. And joining me today is senior mortgage banker with Flat Branch Home Loans. Beth Langston. Thanks for being here, Beth. Thanks for having me. Yeah, we're, we're glad to be talking about this. And I know this is something that affects everybody. Obviously, we all have to have a place to live. And quite often with divorce, we're talking <clears throat> about the number one question that most women have, which is, can I keep the house? Now, not every woman wants to keep the house uh, or has the ability to keep the house, but it's oftentimes one of the very first questions that is asked. And sometimes even before a divorce is filed, a woman is asking herself and anybody who th- she thinks might have some expertise on it, whether or not she might be able to keep the house. So I think it is very good for us to just take this apart and make sure we really understand it. So let's, uh, first of all, just talk about this from the perspective of when to be thinking about this. And in my recommendation, it is to have that conversation as early as you can with a trusted mortgage loan officer. I've known of women that have done this before they even filed for divorce, really before they were even sure whether they were going to file for divorce. Um, In your experience, have you talked with women who are wondering about this maybe before they file? Yeah, definitely. Um, You know, a divorce situation, uh, especially for a woman who may not have worked full time uh, or let's say has been taking care of the kids or, you know, near retirement and, um, you know, maybe wants to slow down, but not sure that if they could afford it on a retirement income, should they go through a divorce? The earlier, the better that you consider this um, to educate yourself as to what your true financial situation is, the better, because there are so many moving pieces to it that you may not be educated about, especially if your spouse or a significant other controls the finances. Yeah. And that's a great point. I I think that just really (laughs) looking at it like an education, because I think sometimes when you're in that space of... I think I'm going to have to file for divorce or, you know, maybe you just did or you're, you've just been served papers. I think there's a lot of fear that goes into just talking about it because it's like, it makes it a reality. And, you know, we don't have sometimes a really great grasp on what our financial situation is. And so education is extremely important on all fronts. And so I think that's a really great point. Just Look at these conversations as learning opportunities. Connect with 
as many people as you can surround exactly. yourself with and people I, who can help I would, you. I would encourage not only the external uh, communication, like with a you know a loan officer like myself, uh, mm-hmm. or your financial planner, or an accountant. But uh, oftentimes, one spouse will be the primary engagement person with your mortgage person, or your financial planner, or your accountant. And it, I encourage all women to make sure that you're a part of those conversations, to know mm-hmm. exactly what goes into your taxes, what exactly is being reported on your income, uh, what your all of your financial accounts look like with a financial planner or your, uh, you know, your partner's. Uh, 401k or any other retirement assets that may only be in their name and how the beneficiaries work. There just there are so many things that you could potentially have income. Uh, I'm sorry, information shut off. Um, mm-hmm. You know, once a divorce starts, uh, where it has to be forced to be shown versus you know just easily found. Does that make sense? Absolutely, it does. Yes, for sure. And that's a great point, too, that, you know, you don't know what you're going to have access to at every point during the divorce. So the more information and data that you can gather before Mm -hmm. that hard conversation happens, the better in most cases. And again, that's just being educated. That's Mm -hmm. understanding and preparing and being knowledgeable about your situation. It's not underhanded or devious. It's being wise. And, you know, when you're facing a divorce, you have to be wise. You really Mm -hmm. do. I've had um, different women that have come to me that, you know, where they've either already been served or they fear that they are. And, you know, I may run their credit just for a safety check because we uh, a mortgage credit report is one of the most what I call invasive. And I, sometimes that's a bad thing because we find out lots of things, but it's also a really good thing to um, protect yourself. Mm-hmm. Um, there have been times that a spouse has gone up and opened up a bunch of debt in your name and you don't know it. Mm-hmm. Um, and so finding all of that out before a mediation starts or, um, you know, a true divorce start um, would be very educational. Mm-hmm. And um, it, it's interesting how many people I do meet that haven't taken the, they'll, they'll educate themselves outwardly, but they don't even understand how their own life is set up financially. Yeah. Right. Um, so I highly encourage, especially women who have been, you know, d- distracted by being everything to everybody, you know, whether mm-hmm. you work full time and have kids or grandkids or volunteer or whatever all you do to fill your, your life. Um, it's just interesting how much they don't know because they've trusted someone to take care of it all. And it is a big education. Um, so like you said, starting earlier, the better. Yeah, absolutely. That's true. And, you know, obviously credit and housing are intimately commingled. Mm-hmm. Um, we've, I've actually had a couple previous episodes on credit, one in particular that was like over an hour long that talked about how to protect your credit during divorce during divorce. So if Mm -hmm. you haven't already listened to that one, listeners, you definitely want to find that and tune into it. Um, But specifically today, obviously, as we talk about housing, um, I am a licensed realtor in Kansas and Missouri with a specialization in divorce. So this is my area of expertise in addition to divorce coaching and the way that I can best help women through divorce because I can not only help her find a place to live, whether that's Uh, keeping the house she's in now, buying another one, or even renting something, whatever is the best plan of action for her physically and financially and emotionally. But as an RCSD trained divorce collaboration specialist, I actually have some additional training to offer more than the average agent during the divorce process, especially where one party wants to keep the house. And if they know they want to sell, obviously I can help with that. But The main thing with that is just knowing how to work hard to get the most possible for the house to maximize their their equity split. And whereas, whereas unfortunately, too many times they just hire, you know, whatever agent they know. And there's sometimes not a lot of discretion in that. And I I can remember being involved in uh, as a buyer's agent with a house sale that became more like a fire sale because the agent yeah. was a little too loose with the lips about the fact that a divorce was happening and not protecting that critical factor can obviously 
you know, make buyers, you know, see you as desperate and willing to accept a lower offer. So I'm very cautious with that. And, you know, then specifically with regard to them being able to buy, I can help with them doing several other steps in advance of that decision to make sure that they are fully informed on the true value and equity of the home to make a fully informed decision about whether or not keeping the house is truly in their best interest. And the truth is, a lot of times it's an emotional decision. She just wants to keep Mm -hmm. the house because so much else is changing. And she has this preconceived notion that may or may not be true, that her and her children are better off in that house, come what may, no matter what. And that may be true. And if that's possible and it's true, then I will work hard to make that happen for her. But if it is actually true that she really can't afford it or that there's major issues with the house that she's not going to be able to afford in the years to come or whatever the case, if if there's a location that would be better or if there's been abuse or dysfunction mm-hmm. and a toxic environment in that house, that maybe a fresh start in a new environment would actually be healthier for her and her children. We're going to talk about all of those things. And the reason why I wanted to bring you on today to talk about this is because I have evidence that shows that 89% of family law judges agree that not enough is being done with regard to the house valuation during divorce. And furthermore, the oftentimes the result of that is foreclosure, bankruptcy, Mm -hmm. a failed refinance, or even a failed loan origination, Mm -hmm. failing failing to qualify. You're you know you maybe have a divorce decree that states that you have to refinance or to you know go buy your own place, whatever, and you literally can't because of your financial situation. And there's just no reason for it to get that far without that information. This comes back to what we just what we started off saying. You've got to educate yourself early in the process so that you can avoid these financially devastating situations. And it's so easy to do. So what are your thoughts on, let's just start with, she wants to keep the house. What would be your recommendations or considerations for her if she calls you with that mentality? What are you going to be advising her or looking at for her? Well, um, I probably would rely, uh, for example, on you as a realtor uh, to tell me what are we dealing with here in equity on this house? Mm -hmm. Uh, What do you project you're going to have to share with your spouse in equity? I mean, if it's nothing, that's great. Um, If you have a you know, potential payout where you feel you're going to need to take equity from the house in order to satisfy what needs to be met in the divorce decree, then um, we would look at a possible refinance if the rate is, you know, good um, to do a cash out refinance. We could look at a second mortgage uh, and have that be, you know, a smaller payment. Um, that way you can get the debt paid and, um, you know, satisfy it that way and have some time to make a decision whether you want to keep the house or not. But more than anything, um, I like to treat them as though they are divorced, you know, uh, so let's pretend you are, take Mm -hmm. the application as if you are, let's look at your credit, see if there's anything I can assist you with or put you in credit repair to have you be in the best possible uh, credit space uh, to get the best mortgage for you and your kids or you and your family uh, that are moving. And if it is possible to keep it, great. Um, I usually try to wait until after I get either a divorce decree or at least the mediation uh, part completed so Mm -hmm. that I can estimate uh, how much in alimony, if any, child support, if any. Um, And it's easiest to do a mortgage when those payments have actually started. Mm -hmm. Um, So sometimes they are required, you know, between mediation and having everything completed. Other times they're not. And, you know, it's best for us to wait if mm-hmm. the, um, you know, if the spouse will go ahead and start paying right. on that. Um, but sometimes, you know, we have to look at significant time windows also. Um, if your children are in their teenage years, like 15 and up, I can't use child support because normally it expires when it's 18, when they're 18. That's normal mm-hmm. in an average social security income for uh, children, you know, sometimes they have that due to disability or whatever. Sometimes it does expire. Sometimes I can prove it's not going to. Mm -hmm. Um, 
or if you're going to have alimony, at minimum, there is a three-year rule on that. I have to prove that it's going to go beyond three years to, you know, to use that as income. Mm -hmm. Um, So in those cases, I highly recommend that you start with before everything's final, let's see what you're going to need to be able to stay in your home or to, you know, sell it. Let's pretend you've sold it and take the equity and go buy something else. Mm -hmm. Um, So that way you have at least some scenarios ready uh, so that when that paper is signed and it's recorded and it is over, you feel that you are armed to make a new life for yourself, whether it's where you're planted in that home or, um, you know, partnering with you and going out and looking for new ones. I think find that the women who come to me that are ready to plan ahead, but it may not take, uh, it, might, it may not happen right now, but it may be another four to six months. Those are the ones that have the easiest transition because they feel armed with what they need to go into a, a divorce and know that they have um, all of the tools necessary when they are done to make very strong decisions for themselves. Yeah. And that that's an excellent point. And in fact, something came to mind as you were talking, and that is that if, if they had had this conversation with you early with the desire to keep the house, one thing that they might learn is that they need to mediate and argue for at least three years of alimony or child support or both if their personal earned income doesn't rise to the level of qualification for the house. Mm-hmm. They have to, and most people probably don't know that, that they have yeah. to be able to prove those three years. So, you know, right. that that might be a very important piece to know early so mm-hmm. that you can shift the puzzle pieces around as you need to accommodate for that. If, right. if this is, what, and, you know, something that's going to be possible I, for you. I normally ask for four to five um, yeah. because what, what I found is right after, you know, a divorce occurs and they're separating, you know, items in the home or you know, we have to do something quick like a home equity loan or something like that to get them paid out. Then we find that um, sometimes that's eaten up six months of our timeline or eight months of our timeline after everything is supposedly final. And, you know, then we're up against uh, the end of that year of alimony to be able to count it. Right. So, so I don't like to make people, you know, have quick decisions, but I do like to encourage them that, you know, we are on a timeline here. Yeah. And and that's just again, that's a piece of education. It's not a it's not about pressuring anybody or, you know, limiting their options. It's actually about educating them and to understand what it is that they're going to need to meet their goals. And this, you know, specifically being her goal to is to keep the house. Now, what if on the flip side of that, the goal for her is to move? She, he wants to keep the house. She doesn't. What would change there? Okay. A lot of that has to do with uh, the timeline that a judge or a mediator has given uh, the husband to do the refinance to get her off the mortgage mm-hmm. and or the title. Um, you know, there are documents in certain situations where you could have your um, ex-husband sign or near to be ex-husband. I've done this a couple of times, a marital waiver. Uh, saying that they're not going to take interest in your property so that you can sell someone, you know, sell one before you get divorced and buy another one. Mm -hmm. But that kind of leaves a hanging a little bit of information. I like, I like to make this very clean for them so that um, if they do get refinanced off, then um, I'm not having to go back and prove um, that your ex-husband is paying the bill on that. Does that make sense? I, I, yes. if, you want, yeah. if you want to leave them totally out of the equation, the cleanest way, if, if you're wanting to leave the house, is for them to sell it or immediately refinance it within, you know, the first few months. Mm-hmm. Um, there are times that they just don't do it. Yeah. Uh, they, they, maybe they don't qualify. Or, and sometimes you have to go back and say, if you don't do this within, you know, X number of months, then I'm going to take title back and, you know, renegotiate Mm -hmm. yes Um, and that has hurt some of my clients because Mm -hmm. that mortgage is still reporting on their credit report yeah and this is a huge danger warning zone that I talk to women about all the time Mm -hmm. and that is the refinance timeline because I don't know why I wish I could explain it but the majority of divorce attorneys do not write a timeline into the refinance clause of the divorce decree. I insisted on it 
And mine said it Which needs to be smart. done within 90 days. It, mm-hmm. you can, I think you probably could even do less than 90 days. Um, but I have known so many women who are sitting around waiting for that to happen two years later. And wow. you know what that means is not only you can't buy a house, it also could be affecting your credit in mm-hmm. significant ways that you don't even know about unless you're monitoring it. Right. Because what most people don't realize is that one late payment on a mortgage can drop your credit score by a hundred points. And that can sometimes not recover for years. So you have to recognize that those late payments on that mortgage that your name is still on can affect you in ways that could be devastating. And not just buying a house. That's an obvious one. But even renting or getting utilities turned Mm -hmm. on. Because Mm -hmm. all of these companies nowadays are checking your credit because they want to know that you're going to pay your payments. Yep. And so it's extremely important to put a refinance timeline in the divorce decree in writing. Now, does that mean he can't just blow it off? No, unfortunately, it doesn't force him to do it, but it certainly makes it where you could at least have some kind of recourse if Mm -hmm. he doesn't, you know, you could obviously file with an, with your attorney to, you know, demand action on that if it's ordered at, at a certain point versus just, you know, it's six months, it's a year, it's however long mm-hmm. and he still hasn't done it. What can I do? You know? That's so it's a recent uh, client of mine. Um, I am not doing a transaction for her yet because I'm waiting for it to be recorded. You know, I have mm-hmm. a, an initial copy of the, um, they own multiple properties together, which makes it even more complicated. Um, yeah. But the mediator uh, got it into the agreement that the husband, for the amount of properties that he had, had exactly six months to refinance them. Mm-hmm. And if he missed one payment on any of them, all of the properties would become hers. Oh, wow. So you, if you have that kind of strength, because, you know, if you put you know, if you have more than one property and you're helping to maintain it either, you know, by helping with renters or helping with, um, you know, actual maintenance of the property, don't just give up. I mean, you have put work and time into that kind of investment as well. Um, And don't be afraid to ask for a timeline that works for you, not Mm -hmm. what you think is, well, I heard my friend had two years. I heard my other friend had five. I mean, Mm -hmm. there are some ridiculous things out there that I have not been able to proceed on a transaction because they're caught in this refinance, you know, um, time Time time. warp. (laughs) Time warp. (laughs) Time warp, thank you. Yeah. And, um, you know, I'll I'll update them every few months. How's it going? Have you heard anything? Have they done anything? No, they still haven't done anything. And um, so then your only option is a legal option to say, I want it done now. And you have to pay money for that. Everything costs mm-hmm. money. Uh, yeah. But any missed payment while you're still on it is going to be recorded on your credit report. Mm-hmm. And you will have to spend time and money on legal help as well as credit bureau help to go back and prove that you are not responsible for that payment to get the payment off. And that can take several months. Yeah. And you know that this this is a good point for me to mention one of the number one mindset mistakes of women in divorce, really anybody in divorce, and that is forgetting who the decision makers are. Mm-hmm. There are only two people that make decisions in your divorce, you and your soon to be ex. Your lawyer works for you. So I think it's so important to, you know, you said ask for what you need, when you need it, how you need it. I think we forget that sometimes in divorce. We just think the lawyer is the expert. They're the one that makes all the decisions. They'll tell me what to do. Yeah, to some degree, yes, if you have a good one. (laughs) Um, but, But ultimately, you are the only person advocating for you during your divorce. So don't forget that. That's not to scare you. That's just to make you wise to understand when you're making these decisions and thinking about what you need in the outcome of your divorce. You can't just think about what's easy and quick and painless right now. 
you have got to think about your future self in us uh, in six months, in a year, in two years, in five years, in 10 years. How is the, this decision that you're making right now going to affect future you? And don't forget that you're the one that has to advocate that, for that. And, it, and in one more thing I want to mention with regard to him keeping the house along those lines of advocating for you is to be certain that the person that's appraising the house when you're determining the value of it for the divorce settlement agreement is to make sure that it is not uh, an appraiser who your soon to be ex has maybe hired for the purposes of devaluing the house to lower your equity split. So this comes into play sometimes, especially in toxic relationships where, you know, he's planning on keeping the house. So it's to his benefit for it to be devalued. Whereas it's to her benefit for it to be valued high. And the, the truth is that you have to agree on one appraisal. I think in most situations, I can't say that for sure. Obviously, that's a legal matter between you and your attorney, but I've seen it go a lot of different ways. I've seen it where two different appraisals were done, one by his guy and one by her guy, and they just took the average of that value. But I've seen it go where somebody just pulled a, a estimate from Zillow and it's cringeworthy. I mean, it's so just, bad. it's That's so bad. far off. <laughs> so, so far off from reality. <laughs> so these are just tips, you know, to thanks for you to write down and think about, you know, if, if this is your situation. And so, um, and if you're a, in a quick, you know, hurry for, you know, let's say the settlement is done, but he has not chosen to start the refinance process, you may suggest, or, you know, if you're needing, your equity out, um, or at least a portion of it, what I have to do sometimes on the other side, if the woman is keeping it, that um, I suggest a home equity loan um, or, you know, go ahead with, because I can put a first and second together later. Um, Let's say she's not quite ready to be qualified for a full refi, but she could a home equity loan because those are a little less invasive Mm -hmm. um, on the approval process. So, Sometimes they have to get cash out quickly to have that done. Um, And so that is another option, even if you're not quite ready to refi or sell your house. Yeah. And if he's keeping the house, she may want to rent or she may want Mm -hmm. to buy. What would be your recommendations for that decision prior to the divorce being finalized? Well, if um, I've had... Uh, one of these here recently, and we had to do a marital waiver. Okay. Uh, it took a, it took a lot to have, at least in this particular case, um, it took a lot for the soon to be ex to be, um, what should I say, uh, able to give me the documentation necessary to prove <laughs> all of the things that I was needing. <laughs> yeah, um, you know, without cooperative it. was that the word yeah, you were looking yeah, for? Yeah. Okay. yeah. Um, <laughs> And so literally, you know, the day of closing, I'm having to meet him in a parking lot to get him, because I'm a notary, and to get him to sign these particular things, because I don't need him at closing. I just need to, you know, for the marital waiver was the thing that we were signing. And, you know, I had to explain to him for the first time, you will have no rights in her new home. Mm -hmm. But when you are not divorced and you're buying a property before your divorced, there are some tricky things that you'll have to watch out for to ensure that your soon-to-be ex does not have their fingers in any way, shape, or form in the equity in your new house. Mm-hmm. So um, I'm very careful with that to make sure that um, the money that they're going to receive, that their job is in place, that their assets are going to be in place, that all of that is laid out. Because the last thing I want is to have them pre called move in, you know, all of the documentation right. And then for some reason, the spouse, ex-spouse chooses not to pay. Mm -hmm. Then we're in a huge hurt because, you know, their child support isn't coming that I counted on for, you know, qualification or, you know, alimony that may never appear. Um, It is, it's okay to rent for a few months. If, you know, if you're not going to be in the home, it's okay to rent for a few months Mm -hmm. to ensure that that income stability is there. And that's why I always ask for more than three years yeah. um, so you can get at least a good foothold decide what area of town you want to live in what schools do you want your kids to be in for sure 
um, and make all of those decisions with a different, uh, different lifestyle. Because right yeah. now you're in the middle of stress. Once this part is, you know, over, you can have a more clear-minded way to make a decision and how much you want to spend and where you want to live. Mm-hmm. I totally agree. In fact, I am. I want to say there's just absolutely no shame in renting. Many, many people rent during major life transitions. And, I, you know, I'm a real estate agent and I'm saying that. Like, you do not need to feel shame about that. It's perfectly acceptable. And in fact, in some cases, it's very wise to kind of hit that pause button. You don't know where you might want to live. You don't know what kind of house you might want, what school district you might want to be in. What There's just so many factors. Like what, maybe you don't even know where you're going to be working yet. You know, you don't want to have an hour commute to work. So just oh, rent lot, if that's what makes my, sense. Um, a lot of my clients in that situation have really kind of considered it a resting space. Mm-hmm. You know, when you when you've come out of so much trauma and stress, because that whole process can be extremely traumatizing Yeah, um, to be able to come out and just have a few months of peace with no no major decisions mm-hmm. is sometimes very welcome. I mean, oh, other yeah. people, other people have been, you know, free of it because their spouse leaves and they've been in their home for, mm-hmm. you know, a while and having peace and you're ready for whatever the next steps are. And that's fine, too. Mm-hmm. But um I just like to make sure that any client is at the tip top credit, tip top, you know, approval so that they can make a strong decision for themselves and the best decision and not have to be in a subpar mortgage or a higher interest rate or, you know, what, whatever I can do to ensure that they're getting the best of the best. Yeah. And I totally agree. And that resonates with me too, because I was in a place that I rented for about a year and a half before I mm-hmm. bought my first home after my divorce. And it was such a space of just respite and serenity. And, you know, I was in a pretty toxic relationship, so mm-hmm. there was constant drama and that solitude and silence there was just, I mean, it, I grieved a little bit when I left, even though I was mm-hmm. excited to be buying a house I was like, ah, oh, this this is just this has been my safety, my my space. So whether that's in the home you currently live in or if it's a new place you rent or it's a new place you buy, it, it doesn't matter what the physical location is. It's finding that place to breathe and to yeah, recover. You're, you're a different you're a different person six months after than oh, you yeah. were during it. And, <laughs> and you're making making decisions out of what you truly want, not out of stress or, you know, traumatic responses or whatever you're, you're making it from a clear mind. So true. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm not in the hurry with people to make sure that we get a loan closed or, and I know you're not either to hurry up and go buy something, you know, for a sale. I'm in it for the long haul of if I have to, you know, do a pre-approval now and we're good and I'm waiting six months and we're going to do it again, I don't care. Mm-hmm. I just want, I want them to be in um, a good mental space when mm-hmm. they are, you know, making this new decision that is just for themselves or just for themselves and their children. Yeah, exactly. And what's best for them, you know, exactly. ultimately. Uh, yeah, definitely. Now, what if they both want to keep the house? Have you had that happen? (laughs) Um, No, I haven't because um, I don't get in the middle of that normally. Um, I will um, send them right to mediation. (laughs) (laughs) Are you that out? I I do have, uh, you know, a current one going on that um, one has one house in one state that they have together and one house, another house in another state that they have together. So it's a little more complicated because the timing of both refis are going to be... very, um, yes, they, they have to be timely to get done mm-hmm. um, because both of their financial situations will be impacted by how these refinances are done. So okay. um, those do happen, um, but I highly encourage conversation, either if you get along and you guys can just make a list of this is mine and this is yours, that's great. If you can't and you need that mediation, if you can get something in writing, then I can start on it. Um, yeah. In the in the market right now for refinances, I will tell anyone, um, because of the capacity of the mortgage industry this year, um, the entire industry is about at 300% capacity. Mm-hmm. So wow. a, true, a true refinance 
can take anywhere from 60 to 90 days. And it's not because anything to do with the client at all. Mm -hmm. It is strictly because of volume. The, you know, um, we are turning over mortgages, not only that just bought last year that want to refi, but then everybody's moving around with all these different situations because, oh, the rates are low. I can buy a bigger house. Yeah. So the real estate market is kind of on its ear in a good way um, mm -hmm. for that. Um, but the timing of a refinance, I don't want anybody to be misled to think, oh, I can do that in 30 days from bank, whatever. Um, it really is a 60 to 90 day process. So mm -hmm. the earlier we can get started on it, um, and sometimes I can make them shorter depending on the type of loan, the income setup. I'm just trying to be very realistic with everybody. Um, yeah. Currently, you know, it's going to take you a good 60 days to complete the process. So. Okay. Well, good to know. They got to know this. So, you know, and the, the, that's, you know, at the time of this recording <laughs> and who knows, right, exactly. you know, what period of time in somebody's life they may be hearing this. So exactly. that may not be the case, but yeah, this is 2020. Everything will be different, I'm sure. <laughs> yeah. God, we only can hope, right? <laughs> right. Okay. So um, that's if they both want to keep the house. And yes, obviously, if they're going to argue over that, they're go that's going to be a mediation thing, most mm -hmm. likely. Now, what if they both want to sell the house? Okay, well, then um, I, I don't decide on value. That's where I get a realtor um, mm -hmm. team member to um, help me with that because comp reports are very important. Um, they're going to have to decide on, decide on a mutual um, realtor mm -hmm. that they both can trust. And if the comps that their attorney and, um, you know, the wife's attorney they agree on that, that that's the listing price. And mm -hmm. I would highly suggest that you work it out on percentages before you put the sign in the yard. Okay. Um, and that I know you as an agent are very realistic on values because if you, um, you know, make them sky high and hope that they're going to get it, then the arguments come, you know, if you overvalued it and you picked the wrong real estate agent and, you know, all of those things. So if you're just really realistic with your offer, the comps agree, and, you know, with both sides, then it should be a fairly smooth process if you've worked it out ahead of time, who's going to get what. Yeah. Okay. Um, so when you say work it out on percentages, talk a little bit more about what you mean there. Well, um, it, let's, if you have a hundred thousand in equity in your house, um, then hopefully you've already agreed through mediation, uh, or, you know, and yeah, sometimes I do get these amicable agreements you know, <laughs> on paper that this is the way they're going to do things. But um, usually through mediation, they will have worked out percentages that if there is 100,000 equity, then the husband, for whatever reason, is getting 70 and she's getting 30 or she's getting 70 and he's getting 30. Um, those kind of things are very good to know before you put your listing up. Yeah. Um, because the agent, you may not know what's in their mediation agreement or their separation mm -hmm. agreement. And so I think every realtor needs to be aware too of what you're dealing with because somehow you can be put in very awkward positions in talking with both, um, you know, both people. Um, and sometimes you are held to a, not just a fiduciary, but also a keeping things non, you know, on a non-disclosure basis to each spouse. So you have to be very careful that you send them back to the right people to get that kind of information. Yeah. Um, because if I am dealing actually with both people, because it's easier to refi that way, mm -hmm. I cannot disclose anything, income, assets, where they're moving, what they're doing. Mm -hmm. I have to be totally separate as if they don't know each other yeah. when I'm dealing with two people. And that's a good point because honestly, a lot of professionals, as you go through divorce, are only dealing with one party or the mm -hmm. other. As a divorce coach, I'm only dealing with the mm -hmm. woman that I'm coaching. I oftentimes never meet or speak to her soon to be ex. Mm -hmm. And but yet, the realtor and the mortgage loan officer may very well have to be able to work with both people. And so that's an excellent point that they need to agree on that person, trust that person. Um, and then have somebody who's sensitive enough, sensitive enough and skilled enough in the divorce real estate process to advocate well for you and to work on your behalf during the most emotionally trying time of your life mm -hmm. where neither one of you are really thinking straight. And it would be super easy 
for you to be taken advantage of. So that that's extremely mm-hmm. important, and I appreciate you pointing that out. So, so let's talk now a little bit about. Those, go ahead. I was just going to say, and that's why that's those mediation agreements. Um, you know, at least uh, sometimes the temporary separation agreements, those kind of things are very important to share mm-hmm. with your agent and your um, loan officer or your financial planner so mm-hmm. that you can make sure that everybody's on the same page. Yeah. Um, because the last thing I want to do is say something incorrect to your soon-to-be ex-spouse. Yeah, absolutely. Does that makes sense? Mm-hmm. Definitely. Well, let's shift now into talking about the kinds of things that somebody is going to need to be thinking about. Maybe um, if you're listening to this now, you might want to grab a piece of paper and a pen. We're going to talk about some specific things that you're going to need to discover as you go through this process. Uh, If you're going to be needing to work with a mortgage loan officer for a refinance or a purchase. So let's start with um, what debt is actually in your name. Um, You know, that's... (laughs) a big subject. I mean, you would think that would be cut and dry, but honestly, it's like you mentioned earlier, you run a credit report and you find things on there that you didn't know existed sometimes. And so it's very important to really do some investigation to make sure that you truly know every debt that you have in your name. Right. And when I pull a report, I can tell you if it's a joint report with your spouse or if it is only yours or only his, because those are the kind of things going into um, a mediation that you'll need to know if you need to have your name taken off of something or if you need to let some let your spouse go as an authorized user on something. Yeah. Um, a lot of times you've made those credit applications so long ago, you forget whose is what. Mm-hmm. And um, it's really good to have that information in front of you before you get ready to mediate. Mm-hmm, for sure. So what are some other things that you can think of that she is going to want to discover during this process? Well, well in the in the credit uh, run, you're also going to know what your scores are. Mm-hmm. Uh, I can let them know what they're going to need for a new purchase, um, the types of loans that they could currently qualify for. Um, if we did a little work, what more they could qualify for, uh, what income they would need to sustain the way that they live right now. Uh, with the current house that they have. Um, I can help them figure that out. Um, I may not know all the extras, you know, all the Mm -hmm. things that aren't on your credit report, but at least for those debts that you're going to have to keep, including your house, I can at least give you an idea of the income you would need to qualify for a refinance on your own if that's what you want to do. Okay, that's good. What about professionals? Oh, I, I develop usually a pretty good team when uh, I'm dealing with soon to be divorced or currently divorced people, um, a lot of times they haven't worked on their credit at all. Sometimes they don't have an agent that will be patient enough in the process to understand they're not just trying to find a place to live. They're they're rebuilding their whole life and remaking themselves. Mm -hmm. And um, you need someone like you that's in their you know, in their backyard with them, helping them (laughs) get everything together. Um, I work with a lot of financial planners. I work with a lot of, you know, private bakers, estate attorneys, those kind of things. Because even though I know you deal primarily with divorce, I deal with widows as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And they go through some similar processes. They sure do. And, you know, they have to start over as well. And so I highly encourage them to go through the process that you, um, you know, you're taking people through. It's different, but yet it's not because they're starting a different life, you know, on their own, taking care of children, perhaps, um, and needing to find a new life. Um, So I'll work with whatever team is already in place, or I may suggest that they go get a financial planner or, um, you know, a new accountant or things like that to help them understand each aspect of their finances. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, in coaching, we talk about the fact that in any divorce, there are actually four divorces, the legal divorce, the financial divorce, the emotional divorce, and the social divorce. And there's a different expert needed for all of those things. Your lawyer doesn't do all of this. Your usual financial planner might not even do all this. There's a specific kind of certification for financial analysis that is called a CDFA, a Certified Divorce Financial Analyst. And they have 
a lot more training on how to understand the divorce process. And so that is somebody that you might want to put on your list. You know, obviously tax advisors, therapists, coaches, child experts. You want somebody that's going to be able to be an expert in all of these different areas to help you with all of the decision making because you're, you know, you're kind of stuck in that primitive brain, that emotional fight or flight kind of reasoning and thinking. And you need like daily infusions of logic (laughs) from people Mm -hmm. surrounding you who have been through this and are not emotionally in the depths with you. Right. So what other concerns uh, or discovery should she be thinking about? Um, You know, not only finding out what debt that you have on your credit report with your spouse, but sometimes you have debt that's not on your credit report. Um, Maybe you all have borrowed money from someone. What what responsibility are you going to have with that? Maybe you're a co-borrower on a loan with someone else. Who's in charge of that? Are they the co-borrower or are you? Mm -hmm. Um, So the debt may not all be visible on your credit report. Um, So sometimes I have to ask a whole lot more in-depth questions. Um, You know, maybe they borrowed money from parents. Maybe that is something that has to be paid back. Maybe not. Um, What assets do you really have to be attached to? Um, you know, a lot of people just think, uh, it's my checking account and our asset account, our savings account, our kids 529 account. <laughs> yes. and, yeah. and, they for, and they forget there's retirement assets. They forget mm-hmm. there's home equity. Um, you know, there's jewelry collectibles, you know, all those kind of things that you just don't on a day-to-day basis say, you know what, that is part mine because you, yeah. you just lived it. And so, um, I don't get into those details as much because they're not, you know, like valuables are not usable in my world on, unless it's something that you could sell to mm-hmm. use as a down payment on a house. You can right. sell, not sell cars, you can sell paintings, you can, but with bills mm-hmm. of sale, we can use those for down payments on houses. Right. But, uh, so we may have to move some money around or may have to move some assets around to get you where you want to be on the home that you want with the payment that you want. But uh, I just try to be creative and have you go through your whole picture, not just what's on your credit and the paycheck. Right, right. And, you know, besides your debts and your assets and your material possessions, some of the other things that are going to come into play are your actions that you're yet to take. For example, is your divorce going to be able to be resolved in mediation or is it going to go to court? Because that's going to make a huge difference on the bottom line that's going to be owed to that attorney. And right. what are the costs for you, whether you go one way or the other? Sometimes this ha- this comes up when, you know, a couple is just stuck arguing over some, you know, single point that is yet unresolved and they're willing to have their attorneys at $350 an hour yeah. duke it out over this. And it's like, look, you have spent more than the value of that refrigerator, you know, right. so this is not worth arguing about and or, you know, obviously there's bigger things involved in that as well. But but you've got to know kind of an, or at least have an idea as you go through this uh, that going to court is extremely expensive. You want Very, to avoid yeah. that if you can. Absolutely. So yeah, um, and then what, you know, alimony, child support, what else do they need to be thinking about with regard to the actions that they are getting ready to take in this divorce? Um, you're going to have to make some de- cho- some choices about how you want to receive the assets from your marriage. Um, you know, are you going to force a refinance on your other spouse? Are you going to have that are you on, on your spouse? Are you going to have them get the equity out of the house or out of their retirement assets immediately? Sometimes you can forego that because let's say uh, your spouse's 401k is doing great. You can forego some of that but still have access to it and rights to it. And a good attorney will show you, you know, how you can do that where it still becomes your asset or something you have access to, but it doesn't have to necessarily move currently. Yeah. Um, you know, if you want to figure out your where you stand and let's do pretend scenarios, I do that a lot for people. Mm-hmm. Let's pretend I have, you know, $3,000 in alimony, $2,000 in child support, if that ever really happens, but that would be good. <laughs> yeah, right, right. Um, you know, that would be awesome. But let's pretend I have that plus my job. Can I do what's on my credit report plus go get, you know, a new hundred and fifty to two hundred thousand dollar home? 
Can I do that? And we'll play with those numbers until we make it work. Um, But I can't make you go retro and say, oops, I should have asked for 500 more in alimony, or Mm -hmm. I should have required, you know, $500 more in child support. I can't help you then unless you want to go back into, you know, mediation or back to court to get more, which is extremely expensive. Yeah, for sure. And, you know, education and preparation can only go so far and then life happens. And sometimes Mm -hmm. there are safety issues in a relationship and a woman needs to leave immediately or something else big happens and we have to do some damage control. Talk about that a little bit. Well, um, that happens a lot uh, where it is a forced quick, um, you're not going to get anything. Maybe he doesn't have anything. Maybe really you've been left with nothing um, except, you know, the clothes on your back and you know, maybe you can afford it with your own job where, where you rent. Um, I have helped people recover their credit. The longest um, person that I worked with um, was 11 years. And we worked very hard on their credit. Uh, they had been through bankruptcy with um, their previous spouse. And we went through this scenario where um, they had to spend the time to recover. So we would check in with each other, you know, like every two months, see where they are in credit repair. She would pay off what she could at the time. um, And her score gradually recovered from what her ex-spouse had done. Mm -hmm. Um, So it's not that I worked 11 years just to get her to buy a house. It was 11 years to help her recover, get herself back where she should be um, and uh, very successful story and it wasn't just because of me it was because of a whole team of people around her and encouraging her so the biggest thing I can encourage the women that you are working with is make sure you have a professional posse Mm -hmm. (laughs) around you Um, (laughs) not just your personal posse you know that is all about where you're going but the professional posse that has your back has clear mind we're not emotionally involved Exactly. In, in this, and we can give you suggestions that you may not be able to see because you're too thick into it. Yeah, I mean, that surrounding yourself with a good team cannot be underestimated. And mm-hmm. unfortunately, it is all too often. Mm-hmm. I've talked to women every week who are just trying to figure it out on their own. And I, and I ask for permission to challenge them and they give it. And I say, you need to stop trying to do everything yourself. Mm-hmm. You don't have to do that. And I promise you this, it will lead to regret because you are unavoidably emotional right now. Nobody goes through a divorce without being emotionally handicapped in some way. And yet you're having to make some of the most biggest decisions of your life. So right. you need people around you to bring you back to earth and to offer you some logic and you know maybe even they have experience that you don't have in these areas so you definitely need help to get back on your feet get your feet back on the ground I guess and you know right. to, to start over again so uh, give me some more feedback on that what do you think about that um, you don't have to be in a hurry to do it just like everybody else thinks that you should I mean you need to get used to being in the driver's seat sometimes. When I've had uh, clients come out of a relationship where they weren't necessarily the one in charge financially, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, I can't expect them to know how to do it. And so um, it's a learning process. Sometimes just budgeting is a big deal because they've never had to do it before. They just, you know, had their credit cards and, you know, put their money in the bank and that's all really they knew. Mm -hmm. Um, So I can't expect someone to be up and running and raring to go (laughs) after being through a very traumatic experience. Um, You know, and if you're not working with someone that has patience with you and for you, know that you deserve that. Mm -hmm. Um, And maybe you need to get a different, you know, team around you. If they are not being patient, encouraging, supportive, um, allowing you you to learn enough to be in the drive, your own driver's seat. Mm -hmm. Um, so it doesn't have to be a hurried process, but, uh, when, you know, when everything is over, it does not have to be a hurried process. However, just my whole thing about this whole talk is that you need to educate yourself about your own life Mm -hmm. Uh, because no one else can do that for you. That's right. No one. Yeah. 
And, you know, I know that you would agree, you know, we both work with many people recovering from the consequences of leaving relationships, marriage or otherwise. And mm-hmm. we both love helping people like this to get definitely get definitely. themselves back on solid ground. It's a joy to, to work with people and, and especially those that are struggling to stand on their own and take care of themselves to show them that they can is is very rewarding. And so I thank you for taking time out today to talk about this because I know anyone listening in this situation is going to be helped by this information. So thank you again. It's an honor to be here and I'm I'm so excited for you and um, all of the passion that you have to help other people um, after being through what you've experienced. That's kind of really the whole goal of what we do, right? Is that Absolutely. we help people through so you can go help somebody else. And um, I I would love to help anyone else if they, you know, we don't charge I personally don't charge anything up front for our services. I'm paid by banks when I do my mm-hmm. transactions and it may be three years down the road, five years down the road. Um, yeah. So I don't want people to be afraid of getting education right up front that, oh my gosh, that part's going to be too expensive. It's really yeah. not, really yeah. not. Absolutely. And it is great to have a team of people that are as passionate about it as I am. And I'm glad that you're on that team. So thank you. And, you know, the truth is one of my taglines is divorce well, live well, because it is all about ending well so that you can start fresh and live a life that you maybe have never imagined, create a life that you've always wanted. And that's what Starting Over Stronger is here to help you do. So thank you all for joining us today for this conversation. If you need more information about divorce and your mortgage, you can reach out to me or Beth and you actually just email me at Annie at Starting Over Stronger. I'll get you connected to her. And thanks again, Beth, for being here. Thank you so much for having me. It's an honor to be here. Absolutely. Thank you all for being here. And I just want to say again that we are here to help you as you go through divorce and to offer you hope as you are starting over stronger. 